Cool. Cool. Can you all see it? Yeah. Great. Yeah, looking good. All right, great. So we're Raw Architects. We are Raw. Um, and there are more of us, but they've all gone home now. Um, and we started five years ago. Um, and so, yeah, we're, so look, we are a small emerging practice. We're based in Northwest London. Um, not so North London. If you turn off your Pinterest stuff. I don't know how to do that. Sorry, guys. It's okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It goes on most from my iPad. So what we want to talk to you today, basically, is sort of about our journey over the past year, sort of what we've learned. Um, so sort of key projects, where we are at the moment as a practice, our key projects about us, our studio, the way we work. And then also sort of the future on RAW, sort of reflecting also on the discussions that we have, Sean and I have, about the future of architecture practice and sort of how we think architecture practices, small practices can like respond to that and what we can do about it. Mm -hmm. um, which I think also may relate to you guys being students or about to enter the world of architecture. So our past. So touching very quickly, so Sean and I, we met about six years ago whilst working for a practice. Um, our backgrounds were completely different, sort of highlighted by the two images that are on the screen. On the left is sort of Sean's background, which is sort of um, client focus, bespoke, private residential projects. Yeah, small, medium-sized projects. Um, but projects that were delivered on site. I worked for a much bigger practice, um, so it was larger projects that took a lot of time, much more process-driven, uh, commercial clients. So this was a project that I worked in Luxembourg. It was an infrastructure project, a tram project, um, and didn't actually get built. Um, so therefore, my experience was completely different. So we sort of had this thing where we sort of meet in the middle, completely different backgrounds, and so that completely changes how we sort of approach architecture and how we approach running a practice. So June 2016, this is sort of our startup. Um, day one. Day, day one. one. Sort of like literally it was the day Brexit was announced. Couldn't have been the worst time to start a practice. Awful. So we just thought, you know what, let's just go for it. Um, I think this image here sort of represents that. Um, and I remember we were looking for a studio in Tottenham. It felt like the world had ended. It was a ghost town, absolute ghost town, driving yeah. around, looking at whatever we could afford, whatever we could find, yeah. um, and realising, is, is this the move that we need to make yeah. right now? And so we thought, this is it. Why not? It can't get any worse. <laughs> yeah. Let's just do it. Um, so Tottenham, we, we stumbled apart. So Tottenham is in so North London. Um, it's on the outskirts. It's an area that's changing. It's gone through a lot of change over the last few years. From the riots. To like, From the riots. So there's a lot of money dedicated to sort of regenerate Tottenham. And we sort of, we came here through a potential project. And when, when we got here, we were like, what, what is this place? There was artists, there were designers, there were street art everywhere. And like, we didn't know this place existed. And it just felt like something was happening. There was one of the, something that someone told me, um, it was the intern they have makers in the whole of Europe. Really? Yeah. So all the little studios and back alleys that walk down every single yeah. day, they're filled with people. There's people that are making clothes, like take you know, photographers, making furniture. There's furniture on our way into the studio now, there's like three furniture makers. There's a whole fashion floor. There's a warehouse full of just music studios, which yeah. you have no idea. So this, so on the left is an image of so Argent sort of own um, the whole of Tottenham Hale. And They're so like a big, big little land. Massive land. developer. And obviously what they did to King's Cross is phenomenal. And so it's been a very interesting watching all these high rises going up, sort of waiting to see what happens. On the right, this was our first studio, which is probably the, the best image we could find. <laughs> probably luckily you actually can't smell it either because it didn't smell great, <laughs> right. but it was cheap enough for us to get going um, on our starting point. Uh, so for the first year of our lives, we really had sort of two main projects each. My project was the image on the left, which couldn't probably have been a, a harder project to start off with. It was, was a a basement under an existing house. The contractor had made a complete mess of it. He'd been sacked. The client, when I first met him, was in tears. And we'd been approached by the, a new contractor to see if we can deliver this project. So sure, why not? Basement swimming pool, let's, let's, let's just do it. Let's do it. Um, learn an absolute, absolute ton on this project. Um, then the first the project on the side, the other side there, is a house in Hammersmith Grove in Hammersmith. Um, it was a 
large, almost like mansion, semi-detached mansion. Started off as a, a flat refurb, and then I ended up doing three different projects. There was the flat refurb, there was the whole building refurbishment, which had to be done for the freeholder. Um, and then there was a recording studio in the ground floor flat that linked onto another building at the back for uh, Warner Brothers. And we ended up doing that. So one project uh, turned into three projects um, and three different clients and all the problems that went yeah. along with that. I think what we love about these two images in particular is because you can see it under construction. So the left, you can see all the rebar for the swimming pool, the right, you can see all the scaffolding. And it's that reality where you're going to yeah. these meetings on site that everyone's looking at you. Um, it is, yeah, interesting. Um, and, and basically, our sort of first experience of just saying yes to things, mm. like that's the way we wanted to learn, to sort of just push ourselves and then find out about it as you go along. One of the um, other things that we, when we, both left the other practice was that our boss basically told us to build as much as quickly as possible yeah. so that we could actually get a portfolio of our own work and, learn. and rely on yeah and learn but not also rely on work from the past yeah to kind exactly. of carry us through so and the one thing to note though these projects these two projects literally dominated our lives for a year we lived we breathed them now we've got multiple projects going on but for this we knew absolutely everything about these projects so we sort of sum up those first, those early years by this approach of just saying yes, like not being afraid to make mistakes. Like just, can you do this? If someone asks you, yes, we can do it. Speak to people, speak to different architects, engineers, m and &E engineer, the, the contractor, the amount we've learned from speaking to the contractor about how you actually build things. Stuff you may not necessarily learn in university. And we felt like this idea, which we still use today of just saying yes, um, has sort of opened doors for us. Yes, it's, it's meant that we've can, we've not just been able to do the resi stuff, but some commercial work as well. Yeah. So present day, so that was sort of our early years, and so sort of where we are at the moment is sort of an emerging practice that is growing and changing, highlighted by the images here. So these are our three studios, all in Tottenham that we've been in. Sort of on the left was the the first one, 2016-17. And you can begin to see sort of the growth of like taking people on, better infrastructure within the practice, better organization, um, and hopefully better space. So the middle <laughs> image was basically at one point we were, we were squeezing about seven people into a space that's probably only for four yeah, people, definitely. plus a dog, plus bikes in the background, yeah. um, and plants, of course. And then where we are today, so we, we worked on this project, which will come up later, and we jumped up to an opportunity to move to this bigger studio. So. As you can see, we feel like it looks more professional, yeah, it, organized. It, and it allows growth. Allows growth. We want to be in the next two to yeah. five years. Um, people. So there's Sean and I, uh, the directors, the architects. And what we're trying to do is really build a practice that is for a mix of people, mix of backgrounds, mix of education. So we've got our... Carolina, who's our architectural assistant part two, who's also a sustainability guru, who brings that dynamic to the practice and is teaching Sean and I so much about that element of the work. Our um, superstar interior architect, Milana, who is, has a background in architecture and both interiors, is sort of now leading our interior arm. Yeah. I say arm, it's only a few projects of the <laughs> practice. Um, but then also dipping into some of the commercial work and architectural work that we've got. And it, her work also feeds into everything that we do. So what's been quite good is that we can steal some of her talents and yeah. apply it across all the different projects as well. And it's just great because she thinks about interiors, how that, that can actually affect the external elevation of the design of the building. Mm -hmm. um, and then helped us build this sort of samples library that you can see behind us as well. Um, and then we've also had Hannah, who unfortunately left us very recently, so we're still heartbroken over that. And she was a architect, qualified architect, and also a sort of a community engagement artist. So she brought this mad dynamic of like being able to coordinate the most complex projects or our most complex projects, as well as doing this community engagement artwork that was so different from architecture. Yeah. Um, so the discussions that we'd have and how that would impact our work. Uh, we felt just really added more um, to all. So our approach, we've got this, these kind of three ideals that we tried to focus in on at the beginning of, uh, I guess, last year or the year before, was just about how we're trying to work and trying to work as a practice and trying to also work with our clients. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so it's basically like, 
In terms of the open approach, it's being really open with our fees, trying to be transparent, open, trying to break down the, the, the steps of architecture as much as possible, sort of having design workshops rather than design client presentations. Mm -hmm. Um, so trying to have a much more open approach with us, with our clients, but also with the way we operate the practice. So therefore, like, again, so fees are transparent for everyone to see. We try to make sure everyone knows what everyone's working on. So they know the pressures Sean or, or and I are under and where we're trying to get to at the end of each week or at the end of each month. Mm -hmm. Something that's been a really difficult challenge during COVID, but now we're sort of back in the studio. We're really working hard towards having this sort of open approach yeah. again. Tailored. So, like, whilst we don't love this word, we feel like this is word that's it's grown up. A bit grown up. We feel like it does sort of suit us in terms of we don't have a style. We don't have one way of doing architecture. All our projects we feel are completely different. So, we've got sort of high end residential projects, sort of much smaller, quirky, um, like East London, -y type East London type projects, and a much tighter budget. And then we're looking at sort of mixed use commercial projects as well. And we take each client completely different. And there's the design changes depending on the client, the budget, um, which is so important, and also the brief itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, our, and the way in which we work on it as well. Yeah. How engaged we are with the contractors. Um, is it a big contractor that we can just let leave alone to get on with it? Or are we more with the uh, making stuff? Completely. So this whole tailored approach, we feel, sort of suits the way we're running the projects, running the practice, and also the architecture itself. And young, like we don't shy away from this. We are a young practice. Sean and I are both young-ish architects. <laughs> um, and therefore, like they talked about this earlier about this saying, yes, making mistakes. We're not scared to make mistakes. As a young practice, we want to try and push what we can do and what's achievable. So these images here, um, this was a summer house that I worked on um, and this was all about the cladding. So I wanted the cladding to finish above the top of the building, above sort of the parapet. The contractor was telling me, you can't do this. You've got to put capping on the top. It's not going to work. And I fought hard to get this. Turns out he was kind of right. I'd actually, the image on the right, created this sort of like gutter detail for collecting leaves because there was a few trees nearby. Um, after a bit of like working out, we fixed it. And now we've got the image on the left. So we weren't scared. We made a mistake. It was fine. We discussed it with the client, discussed it with the contractor. We fixed it. And we sort of really tried to embrace this young approach. Yeah. Young and naive. Young and naive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. So these are kind of our three projects that we wanted to talk about. Um, you can see from the pictures, from the plan, sorry, that they're of different scales. Um, and they're, they're kind of representative of the work, the work that we're doing at the moment and that we've been doing over the last few months. Yeah, so there are three sort of we see as milestone projects. So Tennyson Road, which is on site, which is a small refurbishment, um, bespoke construction that we've actually done ourselves. Leverton Street, um, which is this taking this old building, creating two flats um, for a family. And that project itself has been long listed for Don't Move Improve. It's been uh, published in the AJ and online and dwell, which we're sort of happy about, but then it's sort of you move on and start worrying about the next thing. <laughs> and then the archives, which is where our studio is at the moment, which is an absolute mammoth project. So starting off with the archives. So this is the elevation. So this building was round the corner from our old studio. So we saw this building every day for say three years. And we're like, what the hell is going on in this building? It is just this huge industrial monster sitting in the background of Tottenham. Turns out um, not much was happening no, in the building. Nothing, nothing. So this is what every single floor plate, it was five stories of these double height warehouses just stacked on top of each other. And we were approached by a client of ours to, to turn this into sort of a mixed use scheme um, uh, that required an insane amount of infrastructure just to make it a usable building. I think the client, the, the client themselves, they're, they're actually- Yeah, actually, yeah. Right, yeah. the client themselves, their, their name is Purpose. Yeah. And the idea of their company was repurposing these like forgotten, so, left, yeah. unloved buildings for, for, to inhabit studios and bring them back to life and maybe make them a positive um, environment in the community. Yeah, definitely want to touch upon that because the idea is that they find these buildings that are empty, no one wants them. Yeah. And what can you do with them? So the program, so this was on the ground floor was to create this sort of reception space 
food market, event space, flexible with a cafe as well. On the first floor is a climbing centre, which is incredibly popular. Um, so it turns out yeah, we didn't have any idea. I'm not doing it. We're not cool enough. No. And then, so second to fifth floor floor is then studios for architects, designer, radio stations, photographic studios. Mm -hmm. And the upper floors, which is part of phase two, um, is to create this potential restaurant and rooftop bar with views all across London. So this is an image of the cafe. So this is the last thing that was done. So the budget was pretty minimal, minimal, minimal at this point. So we were left to just design these sort of flexible bars as part of the cafe. So it can be moved so it could be a flexible event space and then brought back together as a workable cafe. And then just thinking about the branding and sort of the color scheme and the services. The reception space. So this was just this whole idea for the project, trying to do a lot with a little, using everyday materials. So the brickwork reception desk, um, OSB, and just painting it and routing it out to make it look a bit more special, a bit more different. Sort of really being pushed with what we can do from the materials. It's about masking. Some of the, some of the spaces, the large spaces were beautiful, but some of the ancillary spaces were not. So this cladding, the white cladding actually um, unifies the space Correct. and creates a similar language to the rest of the building. So this was the climb. This is the climbing centre, which has just recently reopened and is absolutely it's packed sort of seven days a week. I'd love to say we sort of designed all these like folding structure, which was actually amazing to watch build. They sort of build it out of plywood. Um, but really all we did was just provide the services to the floor. Yeah. But it shows you the mixed use element of the project. Then the upper floors, so the studios, this is one of the common areas and our all that sort of we were left with here is sort of the paint and the lighting. But what we were doing is creating this sort of green datum to sort of make the building more scalable, more human scale, and using sort of quite nice, cost-effective light fittings as a contrast to the industrial concrete ceiling. And then these glass blocks, which we absolutely love. And they were the only kind of really sexy bit we could actually Yeah, again, have. we had to fight so hard for these to make it work. Um, literally fighting with the contractor at the meeting because the contractor was also the client, which is an interesting experience. Um, but so all the elevations were surrounded by glass, were surrounded by windows and these glass blocks enabled to bring natural light into these communal areas. So this is sort of now through the corridor um, and then the entrance to the studio. So we carried on the sort of the green lines or the green paint throughout, sort of express where the entrance was. Mm -hmm. Each each studio has its own signpost above, so creating like a street as you walk down, and again its own number with its own light above. So just using these really simple elements to create quite a crafted, it's strong, it's a strong, strong design yeah. set against this backdrop of this concrete building. The studios, so. This is where sort of we were told to not be architects in a way. This was all about creating these white boxes that people could then inhabit to do a whole range of different activities. So this was all about just getting the services, the lighting, the acoustics correct. So this image here is actually our studio um, and we absolutely love it. I mean, the windows are incredible, the views over Tottenham. Uh, and as you can see, it's a really, really light filled space. The roof. This is phase two yeah. and probably the bit we're sort of really excited about. We've just submitted the planning for this. Um, everyone around Harrogate Council is really excited for this so to we happen. We had a big meeting about this. We had a big meeting with uh, Mayor of London. With Mayor of London, yeah, of course. So part of this project is that the GLA were really interested in sort of this new um, social community infrastructure happening in Tottenham. And this was a key part of it, extending the cause to create this rooftop bar. And then the image on the bottom right, so this is the artwork that our Hannah um, artist that she did outside of Rawls, she managed during COVID to contact the local schools um, so they could send these pieces of artwork um, to be all about what they want to be when they grow up, this idea that Tottenham is growing up at the moment. And the idea was then she reinterpreted this artwork and to create new artwork on the cause and sort of bring this building back to life with some colour And kind of give well. it some signage. From, from a distance, I mean, this building is noticeable from different parts of London, yeah. Stowe, other parts of East London, and it, it has no, uh, there's no signage. 
it's just in the background and the whole point of this project was not only to bring the community engagement part of it but to try and make it like more of a uh, landmark landmark to represent all this change that's happening like within this this where we are this industrial estate where we're located mm -hmm. so submitted for planning we were told it's going to happen this year may happen next year so <laughs> funding funding let's see what happens but uh, very exciting um, and then the Leverton Street, so this is a kind of the, the medium scale of the, um, the original drawings that we showed you. Um, so Leverton Street is a nice leafy street in North London. Um, it's got these lovely uh, coloured houses towards the bottom of the street. And then in the black dot, that's my, the project we did, which was 90 Leverton Street, which looked like this. Um, it was a bombed out uh, Victorian townhouse um, that sits at the highest part of the highest part of the street so it's noticeable from everywhere um and it's just, it was magnolia fest basically um yeah women's it was a, oh, yeah, so yeah. it was formerly a women's refuge or it's kind of use when the client just bought it bought it as a women's refuge so it's a collection of small building small <laughs> utilitarian rooms, utilitarian magnolia. rooms yeah um, not much life and not much color into it so part of the challenge with this was to the brief was to create two um, two equally sized apartments within a really yeah. tight plan. So on the left is the existing section and on the right is the proposed section. So you can sort of see the black represents all the new construction. So the entire building was basically Gutted. taken down apart from the front elevation. So that Sean um, or Raw, we could just basically mash these two flats together. Yeah. Mash is not a very good no. word, but Sean, <laughs> part, describe it a bit better than me. One of the, the challenges of this was how did we create two entrances, which is part of the was main part of the brief. They weant to have a common uh, common part, so we meant to have two entrances, which then resulted in having more staircases. Three so staircases. Three staircases. So the, the back part, uh, which you can just see the stairs up there, goes up to the top two floors. Um, and the dark green had their own staircases within their own yeah. uh, flat. So that, it, it meant that both had their own identity, both the kids who were going to be living in here had their very own identities, but we were kind of restricted on budget. So paint and everything became a, yeah, so, um, and, a use. And like the success we feel of this project represented these two drawings, this interwoven feeling of these two flats in a very small space, but creating quite spacious um, different flats. Mm -hmm. And then what you can see here is the change on the outside. So the entire building was restored and yeah. sort of brought back to life. Yeah, so a lot of the uh, stonework was replaced. Um, the paint was added. So it's, it's now, it's got prominent, it's really prominent on the street actually. And other, other buildings on the street have actually copied it. Yeah, we've noticed they have been copying the yeah. colours. Not very happy about it. <laughs> yeah. we, have, we thought we trademarked it. I know, it's you it can't trademark time. paint colour <laughs> on our window. Uh, but um, it's, it is a compliment. We see that as a compliment. Um, and then we've got the rear elevation here, uh, which is the main one that you can see on the, any of the press. Was uh, yeah, it's just the, the two extensions, the rebuilt um, closet wing at the back, and the ground floor extension, and then the orange door, which links up to the top flat um, with the staircase just being seen through the window on yeah. the um, right side. So the materials here, we was in the conservation area, so we're quite restricted in the materials that we can use, especially as such a prominent building. So it had to be a brickwork that was similar to the existing property. Mm -hmm. And then on the ground floor, we were allowed to sort of push it a little bit and do something a bit more exciting with the pattern of the brickwork. <laughs> Again, it's just this idea of sort of using everyday materials and reinterpreting it, reinterpreting what can we do slightly different to make it a bit more interesting or just make the buildings look slightly different. And then this idea here with the vertical brickwork, it, it sort of expresses the fact that this is a different flat on yeah. the ground floor compared to the orange door in the background. Um, and then in t internally, we were allowed to, not allow, but the client was really keen on using color um, to kind of differentiate between, between each other, basically. Their brother and sister didn't want to have exact, things exactly the yeah, same. Completely different so personalities. One of, them's a, one of them worked for Victoria Beckham, so it was into fashion. She's very loud as a personality, bold. She wanted this dark staircase that went from the ground floor up to the top of her flat with this plywood stair, which actually looked amazing, actually. Yeah, really so the plywood staircase, that's something we designed in-house. We worked with a, a sort of a joinery contractor to sort of bring it to life and modeled it. Uh, to prototypes to sort of sell it to the client, who luckily was very up for doing something like yeah, this. spending the money on that. And spending the money, and it took an enormous amount of time yeah. and effort and sweat and panic. 
um, to make it work. And working again, going back to work, talking to people, working, you know, what the drawings that we'd given to the joinery contract was like, this doesn't work. This is how you need to do it. You're like, okay, fine. Like, look at the model. We built it in the studio, literally on the floor. Um, And then the the bathroom there just kind of showed it's another another way that we use color as a way of uh, of creating some character and pop to um, some of the other flats. I mean, a lot of it was budget driven. So the staircase we spent more money on um, say like twenty thousand pounds, but the bathroom we needed to spend the money on the tiles and the fittings. But the paint was a, a cheaper way of creating some identity and a wow factor as you. Um, and because it was these small rooms interlocking, the idea is like how can we make these pops of colour? These moments where you open the door and it looks completely different to the room behind you sort of helps actually make the whole thing quite spacious and yeah. bigger. Yeah. Sort of this strong contrast. Um, I think that contrast also applies to the two different kitchens. So we had to design two bespoke kitchens and designed one, completely in-house, absolutely everything. And then the one of them, kind of the green one, is a bit more grown up because the ground floor flat was going to be used by the parents. So it had to be a bit more uh, grown up. Um, and the top one was used as the, by the designer. So she just wanted some like younger, fresh materials. Um, yeah. And it, you can see it just feels younger, yeah. fresher. So like the challenge of this project is always about how do you architecturally like lay this out, get it through planning mm-hmm. in a conservation area, and then how do you create these two different identities in this historic building? Yeah. So the building almost looks as one on the outside, but internally you've got two different contrasting flats yeah. that sort of come together this through shared amenity space that you can see in the background here. And they don't feel like a developer flat. There's no, a level yeah. of, there's a, the architecture really on part, as, as well as the finishes, is, is the layout. Like to squeeze in two bedrooms, three bathrooms on one of the flats, and then three stair, two staircases on another one. Was, is, it was yeah. a real challenge. And so just going back, one of the things we learned from our earlier projects was always like trying to work out where sometimes the architecture is and understanding that sometimes the staircase can be the piece of, piece of architecture in itself. And then it goes back to this idea of the different people that we have working in the studio of having like the architecture and the interiors and the interior being architectural as well yeah. and how they're all interwoven. That they're not separate. We all see it as one thing. So we all try to approach every project in this sort of holistic way. Um, and then we've got Tennyson Road, which is a kind of smaller project on here. Um, so this project, just to say, sorry, this is on site at the moment. Um, this isn't finished, but we really wanted to show you a project that is happening now. And then you'll see later the, the site photos. So this, this is a house in um, East London, in Walthamstow, um, where some of our projects actually are at the moment, which is a younger uh, area, loads of people from Hackney, which is like trendy and moving back there. Um, and we were basically tasked with creating a space that was to do for their whole family, their growing family, and where they liked, to, they're Australians, so they wanted to have a big place to eat. Um, and so then, so this, sketch here on the right was all about the ceiling, the light coming through, and that's on the left, and that was the starting point for the project. It was done by one of the part ones that worked for us at the time. Um, and this is what the client loved. Um, and on the right, so this was the, a model that we made for the project. Mm-hmm. Um, we sort of, this project, because of this, the way the ceiling works, you'll see, we've had to really, to understand this, we've had to really think through making. Um, we don't get to do that on every single project because they're not all applicable, but on this one, it, it really suits The time well. was really up for it as well. So this here, you can see these images. This is the model that we've made. Um, uh, and the roof on the left is this, it's basically the CNC plywood roof. But to understand it better, we had to make a sort of a 1 to 10, 1 to 20, one to 20, 1 to 20 model. 20 model. Um, and then you can see here the images on the right. And what I quite love about this model is that, like, especially with its laser cut, is that all the burnt edges. So it's like this idea that's not perfect. Mm. So the client could see that it was like this working model um, and understand that the idea that it may change, we develop the project through detailed design, through uh, tender and cost constraints, but the idea is, is still there. Yeah, the concept still there. The concept is still really strong. Um, one of the main things about this was trying to understand how it would be made. Yeah. Um, and this drawing really kind of highlights our tr- us trying to understand um, how, how on earth it would be constructed and to, what, to how many pieces it would need to be because we would be printing this ourselves. Yeah, so um, what we love to do on these smaller projects is try and really use them as a test bed for future projects. So this is drawing here, shows basically this curved CNC plywood roof 
Um, so this is the ply, this was the drawing that was sent to the CNC company to actually manufacture the pieces of ply with the joists. So, oh, going forward too much, sorry. So from this, with the model making thing here, this image, you can see that these strips of timber that ended up being the CNC plywood, and that is represented by these diagrams, but they're not actual diagrams, they're fabrication drawings. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that we're really keen to do. It's like, how do you actually create this bespoke design, like that plywood staircase? Um, in this case, this roof, but then actually not for the ridiculous bespoke costs that can sometimes come about on our more high-end projects. I mean, like, it still costs money. Well, it still costs, probably ended up being more expensive probably. than we realised, <laughs> as with everything. But it's this idea of like, can we actually make the structure ourselves? Can we fabricate parts of the building? Can we make a door handle? Can we make a roof? Um, and it goes back to this idea of being young and trying to push these things. I think if we had known how difficult this was going to be, probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Lost all the money, <laughs> not made any money. But, but now that we have done it, the amount that we've learned from this project, it will take us hopefully to doing more projects like this or maybe building more furniture in this way. And it's also a way of sort of minimizing waste. So we sort of, to reduce the cost, it's all about fitting it, all the plywood cutouts onto a different sheet. These are the sheets of plywood. So how can we do this sort of minimizing the waste? So sustainability wise, that ticks the box for us as well. How, what, what can we do as architects on these smaller projects? Um, to do something. So these are our beautiful yeah, this, CNC this like plywood. Day one. So all these like this jigsaw turns up and you've got to put this together. The guys have got the drawing that you've seen before and a, and a section. And basically it's being on site, understanding with them what bits go yeah, where. So and we, how do we actually, it's it, like, what? how do the noggins go together? We built this model, but we had to then put, make the sections. Yeah. And what, so... We actually had to then, when this is delivered to site, turn up on site, show the contractor this, no, this bit's that bit, this bit goes to that bit. And then by gluing all these things together, we're actually making the roof construction ourselves. Um, and also it required sort of a hell of a lot of testing um, and templating, templating on site. We were taking the responsibility for the sizing of it. So a lot of it was not down to the contractor, it was us us drawing it and our drawings actually making, there was no room for error, it had to be perfect. Yeah, and we did that by testing it out and cutting it and basically getting the contractor to make a template of the CNC on site um, and then taking an inch here off there or taking a 50 mil off there so that it worked perfectly. Then there's the element of getting a cut, holding your breath and as it turns up on site, hoping that it fits. Yeah. So this here is the two, our two lovely contractors contractors um, testing or putting together some of the CNC plywood on site and us standing there being like, no, yes, move it a bit more to the left, yeah. a bit more to the right, as you can see from this image here. Um, so we sort of get this idea of sort of really working closely and collaborating with the contractor. And what you'd be amazed by is that they're really up for doing something. They're like well this. excited about it. They'd seen the model, they'd seen the images, they, they could see what we were trying to achieve and they knew this was not straightforward construction. So they, they were patient-ish yep. with us and the client and they, didn't and they didn't charge the client more, which is great. <laughs> they didn't at all. And the client themselves also could see from the models that we'd made earlier on what we were trying to do. And we're really, really patient, especially as there's recently been a plywood shortage. Yeah. Um, literally no plywood at all in the whole of the country, um, which has had an interesting impact on the projects. But these are just these uh, putting them together on site and trying to work out which bits go best together. Um, and then also understanding where the noggins need to go. Like we'd drawn it, but when it arrived on site, how does it fit around the soil pipe? How does it fit around some other pipe work that was sticking out at other parts of the extension? Um, and then building the mock-ups to then put them together. So in this, the central picture shows the different sections going together and how do we hide the screws? But a lot of this stuff, we thought about it on site, partly to do with the fact that we just hadn't, hadn't really thought. Yeah, so always with a thing like this, it's you think you feel like you know how it's going to work, yeah. and then it turns up, and then the contractor asks you an incredibly simple question like, "Where does the screw go?" And yeah. you're like, hmm, "How do we hide the screw? How do we hide the screw?" Yeah. <laughs> and and what we've learned from like from our experience over the past five years is you can't be just being there on site um, and just standing there and looking at it yeah. and working out how does that work, how does this work. Um, and that's what these, these images are all about. Um, and they've literally had to glue each item together. We've had to sort of show them by doing a few, a few 
tests ourselves. Yeah. Um, and then we've been getting updates throughout the builds of how this is coming together. And what's amazing is you can sort of see it coming together bit by bit, and it has been quite a slow progress. It's been, a slow, it's been slow, and then this, to, this today, which we've got photos of actually, um, it, start, it came together. Yeah. And it was the first time that we'd actually seen both halves of this curved roof. One is at a lower section and one's slightly higher. Um, but it was the first time that we'd seen them together. Um, and once it's all finished, I think it'll look wicked. Well, yeah, well, we hope. Yeah, I hope so. We hope it looks wicked. Uh, and then, so this is then again now you can see one of the images. This is as the first bit of the roof, sort of phase one's been formed, looking back from the outside in, sort of begin to, begin to get this feel of what's going to happen with the roof. You can see the relationship between this photo here and the earlier site models. Because of the existing levels, because of budget constraints, we had to change the design slightly. But the concept, because the, the concept we felt was so strong, it, it stayed there throughout. Um, I think that also relates to sort of like our earlier high cross project, the archives project, where we've got this strong green datum. Yeah, We're trying to really whistle down what is the strong idea about this project? Um, and this photo encapsulates this curve. I think, I think the roof. one of the things that we learned from this project, and it's also, I guess, a common factor in other ones, is that if you have to just, if you've got budget constraints or you've got a small space like this one, this project here at Tinson Road, you just have to use the same thing. Like monotony, like is really good. Yeah, repetition. It, repetition, and it, it it just links all the spaces together. So later on, we'll show you a picture of a door that we're putting together, which is actually drawn on from the structure of this as well. So it it starts to all bring bring it ties everything together. So these photos are from about four hours ago. Um, and this is where we're up to now with the site project. So on the image on the right, you can really see now the second phase of the roof has been built. You can see that curved structure. You get a really feel now for what this what this is going to feel like, what the experience is going to be of the clients that are going to be using this space every single day. And then you can also see in the center sort of the roof line um, that was probably twice the size originally, but we've had to cut it down for various reasons. Of um, and then you, what's really nice is that we've, we've left got the structure running through, needed to support, but also then you can sort of see the contrast here between the dark and the light, which we think would work really, really nicely. And ultimately, this is going to be exposed internally um, and just painted. So we're trying to just simplify it, hide some of the imperfections, I think, um, and just really, like the, really let the idea of this beauty of the, the structure um, express um, and then and what we find these smaller projects also larger projects even when when the budget constraints are more is like we see the beauty in the everyday um, materials and then also the construction and structure of the projects we love this idea of just opening it up and showing the construction yeah. and using that as the decoration because the client has already paid for it and we've already paid twice so why yeah so why not just show it and for us as architects we find that interesting um, but I think also for the clients, they, they, they can never, whenever a project's like this on site, get their head around like, oh, so that's how a building's made up. And like actually showing these things as decoration um, is, is really interesting and works really well. And then on the left, you can see how we're beginning to clad this thing in brickwork on the outside, which has been that took pretty um, two weeks to do that because they did it once and then it had to be taken down. They did it again and I told them to take it down. So this is the third time it's been put up. They had to cut every single brick or the brick slips at different angles and it was a nightmare. So like one of the things that we're, we're learning along the way is like that not being scared to tell the contractor, no, we don't right. like that. That's not how it's supposed to be. Like having that confidence in the drawings and the design work that you've done um, it really pays dividends because ultimately that's what the clients are there. That's what they're looking for you for, not just to accept what the, what the contractor says you should accept. Mm -hmm. And on these projects, because it's so bespoke, it, it happens. One thing to know, I've got to say, this project is late. It's four months it's late. It's four months late. Um, and the client has been incredibly understanding because they could see we're trying to do something different or we hope something yeah, different. Yeah, doing something, but they're, something bespoke. They're doing something bespoke, but they've also... They came to us because we were a younger practice and they thought that we could test ideas and go for it. And this compared to the people they'd spoken to before did push things a little bit. Yeah. Um, Cause where, where this is based, lots of people do side return extensions. This is the only one that I've seen that's got a curved roof. There may be a reason why for that, <laughs> um, but 
it, 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 it does, it is the only one in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so all these ideas that we're testing out, making the structure, the CNC, cutting it ourselves, can we do that on bigger projects? Where will that actually lead us to? Mm. So on this one, is it also led us to making this door, sort of representing the curves, um, creating this pattern. Uh, to bring things together. Yeah. Um, recently showed the client. The client actually decided that she doesn't like it. So if anyone's looking for a curved <laughs> pattern door, um, then, yeah. then it's up for grabs. But um, no, we're hoping we still, I think we've managed just about to convince the client to keep it. Yeah, he loves it. She's up the And it's basically, it's going to be a sliding screen. You can see in the background, you've got the... It's a perspex. Perspex, yeah. thank you. And that's going to be slotted in between sort of these two bits of plywood. Um, stuck together and this sort of huge sliding partition screen. It's, it's Why I like that because making this a glass screen that size was ridiculously expensive and then also to do something with this pattern in it um, again would have been hugely expensive so it's just like the CNC approach actually building it ourselves um, it's been something we, we really really enjoyed and we want to do more of. That's it guys. So oh, no, it's not. that's not it. I thought it was. <laughs> so, he's very much so this this leads to sort of us the future. Where where do we see the future of raw? Or where how do we see that as relating to the future of architecture practice? So we sort of see ourselves now in a position where we have established ish raw architects. We're now starting to get work through Instagram through our website for our work. Don't underestimate the power of Instagram, especially any aspiring sort of young architects out there. Get the work out there. People will look at it and find it interesting. Um, we're getting work for our work now, so we feel like that is like a solid base to carry on from. I'm not quite sure where that will lead us to, sort of residential and commercial work. And then over the past year, we've been really working on this idea of sort of raw interiors. And then we've got a couple of projects in the moment where we've been appointed just on the interiors to work yeah. alongside the architecture. So bringing in all the things that we've learned from architecture, with sort of Sean's background in sort of bespoke interior projects um, and designing the interiors and coordinating it and leading it. In one case, we took over from the architect. In one case, yeah, we have then taken over from the architects on those yeah. projects. Um, and then the architecture and the interiors is then sort of speaking as one, making the whole building much more powerful, much stronger, and the ideas much stronger. And then this sort of this leads into this idea of like raw construction. So our whole, a lot of discussions we have is what sort of happens to architects? Mm -hmm. Why, why do we have so much sort of less power or less control than we maybe than we used to? Because that's what it certainly feels like. What can we do that's slightly different? How can we diversify the practice so we can actually be doing more on projects? So we've got the raw architecture, raw interiors, and then leading into sort of raw construction. So whether that is like on Tennyson Road, building and constructing the door, building the structure, or is it a door handle, or is it actually going to be constructing the entire projects? Mm -hmm. And all of this, our, our whole goal is towards better quality architecture. But as architects, do we need to do more now I think the to other, achieve that? I think the other thing to, to note is, is the responsibility on cost because that's one of the sticking points that we have. And the raw construction part, if we're yeah. over the costs at the beginning of a project, it means that the client's got more faith and it means ultimately it will be built. We've had some projects where we're just seen as the designer. Then they go to the contractor because they're the ones that they see that have the, the building now and the idea, Correct. the idea of costs and simplify it, dumb it down, yeah, and make it you know value full. engineering. Yeah. But like, why can't we be doing that? We exactly. should be doing that because that's still part of the design process. And this is all the idea of making better quality architecture. So we're trying to create this practice that is has different people from different experiences, different backgrounds, working together and working on different elements of the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's Thank it. you. That is it. That is it. That Sorry, is it. I was I got, <laughs> got excited. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, I personally really enjoyed it. Um, I think we can open up for some questions, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead with one. Um, and I don't think you've mentioned. It's a bit of like like a weird question, but I'm curious. Where does the name come from? Why why roar? So yeah, good question. That honestly took us about three years to come up with the name.
<laughs> so it comes from my surname is Rosenblatt. So that is R O. Um, well, R, sorry. And then I'm the O'Brien. And then Sean is O'Brien. So we were originally going to be like Rosenblatt O'Brien architects, but we hated Mouthful. this. I, we basically used to work out a practice where it was the person's name. So when you picked up the phone, you'd be like, hi, it's blah, 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 blah. And like you felt this like owned by this thing or this person. So we want to create this thing separate from us, raw, that we all work towards. And that all of our employees like buy into that. So it was Rosenblatt O'Brien Architects, but now raw has become its own identity that we all sort of working towards. Yeah. You buy into this like the idea of the company, really. I think that's instead of us. Like or brands, yeah. yeah. The idea that it's a brand, it's not just our names, it's something else. That, that's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. I was I've been following you on Instagram for some some time now. So when you mentioned the Instagram, I was like, yeah, yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing. You can reach out to people really easily. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I was always wondering well, why Roar. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, there you go. Rosenblatt Brian Architects is probably not as exciting no, as like, the name really. itself. So that's why we dropped the surnames and just left with. Roar. Sounds like a you know a couple was, of sixty five years. It was one of those moments where we're like we've written it, come up with so many different names, and then we just somehow stumbled upon that. We're like, yeah, <laughs> it works. We think it. We hope so anyway. No, it it works. It definitely works. Um, also, yeah, I think that's nice as, as to what you said about you can like branch out into different areas. Um, yeah, nope. sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, Alaresa. I've got a question if no one right. else has. Yeah, if anyone has questions, just pop them into the chat or just speak up. Hannah, you can go ahead. Um, I was just going to say this is probably, again, quite a um, sort of theoretical question, but I'm just um, interested like in the long run, um, if there's any other areas that you're quite interested to go into. So you talk about like construction and interiors. Are there any sort of big sort of dream other areas that you'd quite like to explore? I think I think a lot of it, um, a lot of what we'd like to do is also do a lot of furniture making. So it's not just the construction project, but on all of our projects, there are huge amounts that are outlaid by the client for uh, joinery pieces, for example, furniture, cabinetry, wardrobes, kitchens, doors, all that kind of stuff. And part of you know, the background that I had was that we made some of that stuff and we understood the, the, the value that that could add to the project because it always, it always gets value engineered out of the project and you might end up with just, you know, like the most basic, cheapest thing that stays mm -hmm. in. And it's, it's about trying to sell that as a product earlier on and so that people keep it because it's part of the architecture, it's part of how you use the space. You can't just have a white box if you've got no bookcases and no tables and furniture. Yeah, there's no life to it. Yeah, you need that stuff. So then on some of the projects that we do, we do actually do, like, we've done it a number of times, the actual, like, dining table made that as well. So we think, like, that furniture is something we definitely want to get into. We sort of see it as, like, detail. Yeah. And even, like, if it's just a door handle as well. Um, product. Products. Yeah, products, basically. The other thing that I think is quite common for architects, and it's sort of a cliche thing to say, is sort of like development. And like the only thing you obviously think about that is because people are trying to make, do financially slightly better than they are probably from the architecture. But the only way we, we sort of see that as an interesting idea is this, the way that we can just sort of get rid of the client. <laughs> as much as we love our clients, obviously. But, um, and like build our own ideas um, and build something that we're sort of passionate and believe in. So that could be something, but yeah. we don't really know if that is. is. Is that kind of finding a piece of land somewhere, doing a little development, yeah. doing, you know, lots of people do it, but first you've got to find the money to do it, but you've also got to find the land. Yeah. And, that, and it's a challenge. So we've, we've been flirting with this idea of looking at more like there's micro sites because there's so many micro sites to sort of like develop. So look at, can architects do something that we're used to working with these like complex problems? Can we do something slightly different? That's more interesting. Yeah, that sounds really interesting as a um, yeah, avenue to go down. Yeah, thank you very much for that talk. It's really interesting, very like cohesive and um, thoughtful approach, which is really nice to hear about. Yeah. Have we got any other questions? I think there's a few questions in the chat. So, um, Joseph, do you want me to read it out or do you want to speak up? 
so I'll just I'll just read it. So he says, thanks to both of you, really refreshing seeing and hearing architects be so candid about the way they work. I found a comment about getting work from your Instagram account. How long did you take did it take for that to start happening? Had you done a lot of projects or was it quite early for on for you? So it's only recently started happening, I'd say. It's only just started happening this past six months, mm -hmm. actually. Um, and I think that's because the work itself, we've had to get work, build the work. It takes a long time. Do to a lot of work that's not on Instagram. Um, and then with some of our work that we sort of choose, that we're really proud of, that's the stuff that goes online. And that's what people are beginning to see. But we want to push that further. We don't feel like we're doing enough on Instagram. Um, so the only thing I'd say advice on that one is like, just keep posting, keep doing some things because you sort of need to build up a portfolio of work on Instagram. Yeah. But the work itself, you sort of need the work, don't you? There's a lot of the work. A, gets I'm work. always crazy. Always like, Sean, you need to take photos of this. You need to take photos. Cause I, you forget like when we're looking at it, we're, we're looking for the problems most of the time when we're on site all the bits that we're trying to there's a couple of things that are lovely but a lot of them are like oh that's a fuck up yeah. there, or this is something that we need to fix and the stuff that you put on instagram is usually the kind of the the, the nice bits yeah but we also want to show the process yeah. that's really important so clients can see that i think that's really useful i think it's it's the idea that work does get work yeah. so that's why this idea of saying yes because you've got to say yes to some projects you don't necessarily want to do or maybe isn't the architecture you dreamed of doing but you don't know where that's going to lead to and then bit by bit that builds up to getting more work and getting work through instagram thank you i i, I totally agree I, I would love to see more from you on instagram <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know we're thinking about we need to like because we want to do more videos and stuff like that as well but we just yeah, at the moment it's just me, but I'm like, it's on my mind, but it's not enough. We need someone maybe who's just dedicated to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. And then Mimi's asking, how did you hide the screws? Uh, curved roof structure, I, I think it was... Uh, they're basically, they were built in ribs, so two ribs that went down, and then the, the noggins that go across, they're screwed in, so you would see them. Um, but then what we've done is we put then another set of duplicated it so they go back to back so you don't see them. Um, and then the final one is glued in place so you don't see any of the screws at all. It's, it's, it's completely concealed. To take it apart would be a nightmare, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's virtually impossible. Yeah, that's how um, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's, they're, they're hidden behind um, the back to back pieces. I hope that answers your question, Mimi. Um, okay, and then Jason is asking, thanks for the talk. Do you see what you um, do you see what you did setting up being replicated anywhere else, or is London the best place for the diversity of, of clients you've had? I think so. the earlier clients that we had. I think it's difficult because yeah. I'm where I'm from northwest slightly outside of london so therefore like when you're starting up you we you do have to well we have to lean on all, your personal network yeah. friends family um people that you know that recommend you because it's that personal relationship that first may get you the project mm -hmm. rather than the work itself mm -hmm. so i don't necessarily be london focused but because we already had so many contacts in london that that helped us the one amazing thing about london is just the, the scale so we've got projects all over. We've got some projects that are like an hour and a half drive from each other, but are still in London. Um, and then also the diversity of the housing stock. Like it's unbelievable the amount of Victorian houses and what yeah, you can do with these houses. And the, it's the, I think a lot of it, not to be London centric, is, is, is where the money is as well. A lot of, to hire an architect is quite a luxurious thing. It's not a residential person. It's not something that the average person would do that if they need an extension they might get a draftsman or they get someone cheaper but to get an architect you're not just buying somebody who can well, draw, yes, you're buying some like, yeah you're buying ideas and that's that's where the the yeah the need to have the clients need to have some money comes in but, but what i'm finding what having said that what i'm finding with instagram though i'm seeing so many practices are actually not in london yeah. There's practice, I think it's Moxon Architects, they're based in Scotland and they're doing some amazing work. And then there's practices that are based in like Kent and outside of London. 
Um, going back to Amstra, Instagram, it gives you that platform to show you all these things. So I'd say maybe the location, and we're doing now work outside of London as well. We've got approached potentially about projects in Cheltenham. Mm. Um, so like maybe it's not as important just to be London focused. It's just about the clients, the network, and finding the right people willing to take risk. Thanks. Um, but you would say that um, the kind of client clients that you have um, as architects are, are this kind of kind of slightly well off, um, which I hadn't really thought about before. It's a mix, sir, to be honest, a complete mix. Um, but a lot of the time, it's it's, it's, it's like it's the pretty. areas that you're that you're working in, maybe areas where they want to do something that's slightly different, and therefore that may require to hire an architect, to spend the time spending more money than it necessarily just putting it straight into the construction. Uh, so I don't know necessarily it's about the individual, maybe there's, there's a want to do that and they maybe come from the area that they're in. Yeah, I think in, in where, where the Tennyson Road project is, people um, at the moment are buying, I mean, to be boring, they're buying places for not small amounts of money and they're wanting to invest in, in making them slightly larger, but then they can't make them massive but they're investing in the design and therefore that's where you know that part of london where we are is where people are starting to spend money because they, they have value the design yeah in other parts of london it's just about making stuff big so they just want a huge base model. they just want yeah. a big massive rear extension but but what what is the architecture there is not there's not it, you're just creating size space. Is an architecture. yeah size they, they think the size is it and that's where the value is but some of the, the the most interesting projects we've done, I think, in my opinion, anyway, are where yeah. the the property it, it, the desire is not to supersize it; it's to make it more interesting and the quality of space to be better. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. It's a difficult one. There's something we battle with because ultimately we're all studying architecture, and this idea of just doing architecture for people that have money. It's not necessarily like. It does, it's not necessarily why we all got into architecture. It's not for me anyway, but it maybe it's so difficult, but then sometimes to do something interesting, you do need that capital. Yeah. It's something we wrestle with. I'm not quite, I haven't yeah, quite got that. It feels really real. <laughs> yeah. When, when we were at uni, I mean, when I was at uni, no one really talked about money. They talked about how we would potentially not have that much of it. Um, <laughs> but they didn't really talk about fees. They didn't talk about how, how you, you fight how you, you want, yeah right? how you you know we have to fight for stuff they just talked about this idea that you know you go get a job in an office when we when we left part one part two two recessions both times so to try and get a job firstly was like for me was near impossible because i wasn't based in london i was based in the home counties and to try and get a job around there when everyone was losing their jobs was crazy so how do you monetize your skills like no one taught us that yeah i don't know is he, i wonder if they, how i'd love to know the numbers of like how many architects there are in london compared to like the rest of the country but it's, it's the most I've got, to yeah i've got no idea most if you go to uh bristol there are there are quite a few but if you go to say uh east london that will outnumber the amount <laughs> yeah. of bristol bath cardiff like all those places and it's just because I could, you know, like, like we did, you work for someone in a big office somewhere, maybe in like Old Street or in like Shoreditch somewhere, and you go, do you know what? Fuck it, I'm going to go start up on myself because I can make more money or I get one project that means I can leave work on time and not at like 12 o'clock at night. So that that drives you around how people do it more yeah. often because they, there's more, potentially more opportunity. I don't know. Thanks a lot. It's great to hear about like someone talking about the money issue and it's so true. Like no one actually tells you how you're going to deal with this after uni. It doesn't go away. Yeah, honestly, it's <laughs> the biggest problem that we have. We design these ideas. Like when we come up with these great concepts, the client loves them and then we go and get it costed and they're like, what the fuck? Why didn't you tell us? And we're like, oh, we didn't know. So <laughs> one of the things we flirted with is like, can we like, cause back in the day, architects used to price their jobs. Like, can you like, I wouldn't even know where to start. I was taught when I worked for a bigger practice, do not, do not count, do not price anything. That's too much risk. You're going to get sued because that's the world we live in nowadays. So we've talked like, maybe can we bring a QS on board in the practice and actually offer that as a service? And like, can we then like, whilst we're working on the designs, be like, how much is this going to cost? Like, oh, okay, that works. That doesn't work. Like, and make it, make it part of the design process instead of this thing that's just left to the end. 
Um, so on a couple of the small projects now, a couple of projects we're testing now, we're trying to get these the costings in early. But it's also really tricky because sometimes you don't want the client to know because you want them to fall for this vision. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, I know I told you my budget was this, but yeah. I love it so much. Yeah, well, I'll spend a yeah, million yeah, pounds. Yeah, never, I only had 100,000 to start yeah, with. Yeah, it never fine. happens ever, yeah. but... And, and, and we have so it's a real it's a real balance that whole money thing the money thing I mean this week we've just potentially lost, lost the project that we worked on for two years because of crazy mad it's... about it I'm I'm partly relieved to be honest because the client's a nightmare but um, it, <laughs> like he doesn't have to he just like writes the invoice you fine. do know this is recorded <laughs> well, everyone needs to know these things we can cross this out you know, right? when you, when you, when you, when you the project with that particular project was lost partly on the client's unwillingness to spend any money but the realization of what the cost potentially was of the project mm. everyone had given these kind of fanciful numbers that made it sound and fit within his budget but when he actually had it costed properly or you know better by a qs it came out double the price and that's where the problem lies because we don't know we just take these random square meter costs of yeah. numbers and apply know. it to the, the amount of meterage in the house. And then, then if there's a complexity, it's not caught up within the numbers. You saw, so, we've got us off on one now. How much time have we got? Because we could go on for the next <laughs> hour talking about this. <laughs> but no, it, it's but, a current problem. No, but like it's basically one of the things we like talk about a lot is, what do we talk about? It's basically, what was I going to say? Money. Uh, yeah, I've completely lost my train. But it's, it's, it's how do we, how do we how ensure? Do we bring that in to make the design better, that's it. Because architects, I've literally drives me mad. We're, we're seen as this like extravagant person yeah. that costs the client money, doesn't understand money, doesn't live in the real world. And it's like, we, we've done our own projects ourselves. We know what it's like to work up against tight budget. Mm -hmm. We get you can't afford that, so you go for this. We can do all of that and still hopefully deliver a decent design. So we don't want to shy away from that. That also led us towards doing the interiors because interior designers are also or, or have a worse reputation than architects in terms of spending other people's money. Love it. Uh, <laughs> so again, we don't want to we don't want to do that. We want to we want to deliver some amazing interiors without without sort of uh, yeah. living up to this this name tag and, that uh, we've well, got. Some of the clients have come to us and wanted to use us because we're an architect doing interiors as opposed to an interior designer doing interiors yeah. because they they see or know that interior designers literally it's like here's a blank check just go off and just spend what you want and, whereas yeah. we're, we're meant to be socially responsible as a code of conduct not we're for the client's money like we can't spend we have to be transparent about things and all the skills that we learn at university like representing your ideas like honestly the way that we feel like we can represent ideas is better than most other people we've met in the industry <coughs> interior designers interior designers but um not. yeah <laughs> No, but it's, uh, and then like, and then also then the coordination elements, so all these things that we've learned and we, you guys are learning at the moment that can be applied, we feel to different sectors, different parts of the design world. I think it's quite nice what you said about the sort of construction and getting a bit more involved in that side of things as well, because I think that helps with the, like removing this architect as a big sort of person that no one sees and never talks to. So I think yeah. that's quite a nice, um, yeah, sort of adds to that narrative of your practice. I think the contractor would like it if we came less to site, though, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Because we normally, yeah. we're there just going, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. You did mention like struggling a bit, fighting for that cladding or like like different parts of the design. Is it is it really that difficult to work yeah. with contractors? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <It is>. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot. So this no. building we're in now, we started off with this. The client had these amazing ideas and we were designing these bits of furniture to go in here. We were going to have polycarbonate <laughs> camera panels all the way around every studio. The furniture was unreal, the by the way. It was lovely, like, a lovely. And it's all been value engineered. It's veed out, like, gone. So all we're left with is some paint, some nice shiny paint on the lower level of the hallways that you see, which is a, a white gloss, just to add some difference. That's all we were able to have. And anything and the that the client- blocks. And the glass, the glass but blocks. Honestly, the so the glass blocks, yeah, I had to honestly fight, fight really hard for those, really hard. And like, what I didn't realize about architecture school, which someone had told me this at uni, is that like the whole crit process that we go through, we really think it's just pulling out the wall and then, then, then basically telling us that yeah. we're, we're useless or just like, or the worst, like, like, you know, just 
what, what I didn't realize is that actually that is teaching you the skills to be like, no, 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 this is my idea. This is what I want to do. Fighting for something. Fighting for something, sort yeah. of fighting back. And like, how do you represent your ideas? Drawings, visualization, so you can try and sell it to someone and then stand by it. Um, so yeah, it is, that is real. You have to really fight for it. That's, that's, that's really yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Also, one of the things that we, I, I feel, feel that I've learned now that I didn't know at uni was that I used to try and draw absolutely everything and don't have to. Well, no, you do. No, you do. <laughs> but you don't. Because what you really want to do is you want to do, you want to show the most you can in two sections and then some plans or, you know, or a couple what, of images. Just get what, the essence of the project. What we're, what we're trying to do is then, like, you get yeah, all different types of projects and your fees are all different for every project. And on the smaller projects, your fees aren't that high. So then it's like you don't have the time to draw everything. So how can you represent your idea or the detail? Is it just a hand sketch on site? Is it quickly like making something or testing it? Yeah. So it's like, what can you do to sort of get by and yeah, make it work? As few drawings as possible. Yeah. Yeah. But well tested. Cool. Any more questions? Um, I, I don't see any in the chat, so I think that's right. I, I, I might have one more question. Do you feel the need to find a style? I know you mentioned that. You don't really have a style; you just adapt. Do you? Do I think. You... I think from. I don't think we need to find a style. I think there is one potentially developing, not a style, but a common thread. Thread. Yeah, and I think part of that is through. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. But actually. I think we. I think we're starting to come to it from Cause... just looking back at the work that we were talking to you about. I can see, especially when we both came together, there's a common thing there. Of, uh, I'd say not a common style, but a common way of working. Mm. Um, and then hopefully that common way of working and testing ideas will then lead to a more sort of architecture that is all it's not related. What's the word I'm looking for? It's basically inevitable. It's inevitable. Yeah. It's tricky though, because you just start what is a style? And it just it, it varies so much because what we what we're like what we try to tease out of the projects is what does the client want like especially when you work in private houses it's like a successful project isn't what we think is successful it's what the client or like what they see as successful do they love it and they what one client might want it may want something completely different to another client mm -hmm. so it's like that itself that process can lead to a completely different type of architecture but the way of working is still the same mm -hmm. i think one of the projects that we did um, that I thought was possibly the most successful, one of the most successful ones, Grove Road. It's a yeah. tiny, 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 like two up, two down house that became a three bedroom house. Nothing, it didn't, it's not a crazy, over ambitious project. Like exposing but materials. Client, yeah, but it's, I don't even think it's about that. It's about the client was really happy with the space that they got. And the internal layout made it feel like it was a Victorian house the way it should have felt because it was, we'd managed to make it bigger. And that was, that made the client really happy. And for me, that made the, the project successful is that we met the client's brief and we'd done it. Can I ask you your question? Because the answer is we don't know. Reality is we don't know. Do we need a star? Don't know. Mm. Do you think architects need a star? Like, honestly, like we never, we, we lose this, this sort of, because it's our work, we can't really see it for what it is. We don't know. Do you, like, do you think architects need a star? Uh, I think at some point, as I said, it's inevitable. So I think when you become a big practice, then you, you inevitably develop some something that people recognize because I feel like having a style might be a powerful thing to have. Mm. Uh, like when you look at a bigger practice, you realize, okay, I can I can't understand that I've seen it before. I, I've seen their work, I know what they're gonna do. Like you know what to expect. But at the same time, I feel like not having a style is also really good because you're you're unpredictable like you people don't know what you're gonna do so it's like spontaneous it's you know <laughs> you just you yeah. just like then there like it's unique it's yeah so i think it's it's both ways but it depends yeah. i think when you become a bigger practice you're gonna have one eventually i guess i guess the thing is is like if the style um is amazing and gets you work then brilliant go for it no but or not yeah i don't think we do i like to say i don't think we will I thought it was quite refreshing when you said that you didn't have a style. Yeah. yeah. I guess it, when you think about it, sort of Partly when we were, black and white, it really makes sense. When we were for, like, coming together, I think the style would have been a 
whose style are we taking type thing. But I don't, I mean, I don't even think there was one. No, there wasn't. No, we always said at the start, we don't love architects that have a certain, because we don't love architecture that's like, it doesn't matter where it is in the world. Yeah. And it's like, that is their thing. Like, just do it. And like, that's what gets them work and they win competitions. We, that's the opposite of what we want to do. I think where you want to be site specific, brief, client, budget. From LDS, like from where Craig, uh, his old practice, it was all really, you could rigid. tell, it's rigid. You could tell it was a building that they'd done, sterile, bang, 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 bang. It, they were used <laughs> the same toilets. You know, you said it, like it yeah. was the same. It, they, there was something, there was a way of doing it and they did it again and again and again. So yeah, one of the other things we discussed and we're interested in is like then how actually the way you run a practice, like if you run it in this open approach where like people, like we love it when the people that we're working with challenge us and say, no, actually like Craig, I think we should do it differently. I'm like, why? I'm like, actually, yeah, that's a fair point. Let's do it differently. Like, we want that. Um, and then we're interested in if you can run a practice in that way, how does that then reflect on the architecture? Yeah. Does that make every single practice different? Can you see that one project was done by that one person? Don't know. We'll, we'll find out soon. <laughs> I mean, I think, as you mentioned, I can see like a common thread kind of happening. So like some, some projects. Red, that's the yeah. word. Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, so like oh, some small things. Yeah. You want to come and consult for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that good. Wow. <laughs> But there's a there's a comment in the chat. Personally, uh, Joseph says, personally, I find practices that don't pin themselves down to a particular language. I look at Zaha the building, and I'm bored at this point. Same for a big poster. Ah, love it. <laughs> <laughs> is he slagging us off, or is he saying that generally? He's saying that generally. Okay, fine, good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah agree. We agree with that completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. especially like now where we like everything is everywhere. You can see all these buildings on like Instagram and everything, every architecture piece of architecture now is judged like in a second, it's literally a scroll through. Like, uh, yeah, like, like, and it's it, like, it doesn't even matter where it is in the world. So we're like trying to, we're trying to make sure they're all specific to that one particular problem or idea that you've got. Yeah. Problem's not the right word, but no. it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very refreshing, but I think it's just up to the, to time and like how you're yeah. We'll sort of see what happens. So maybe we'll, we'll come back to you in five years. Well, I can't wait. I might not be here, but can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was lovely having you. I'm Thank very you. grateful. Thank you very much. We really enjoyed it. We were panicking for like days about <laughs> being on um, But yeah, thank you very much. It's been a really lovely opportunity. Yeah, we really, really appreciate the invite. It was, it was great. Thank you very much. And I, I think we could wrap it up now. Thank you. All right, cool. Thank you very much. All Thank right, you. Care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a nice evening. Same to you. Bye-bye.